Hello and welcome. You're watching Coronavirus Facts versus Myths. I'm Rishika Barwa. Top focus story today is Kerala. Kerala is the state which has been witnessing a worrying surge in daily COVID cases. On Wednesday, the state recorded 22,056 cases. That's almost 50% of the nation's total tally. The centre is now sending a six-member team to the state to take stock of uh, the COVID-19 preparedness. Now, though the state is vaccinating at a rate which is much, much faster than the rest of the country, the zero positivity rate in the state is low, which essentially means that the percentage of population that has antibodies in Kerala is the lowest amongst all states in the country. Has this put Kerala at a disadvantage? And are all states that are reporting a low zero prevalence now going to see a spike in cases? To make sense of what really is happening in Kerala and how this impacts other states uh, like even Maharashtra, we have uh, Dr. Rijo John. He is a PhD health economist, guest faculty at IIM Kozi Code. We also have uh, Dr. Subhar Salunke, chief technical advisor on COVID-19 to the government of Maharashtra. Thank you both very much for joining us. I want to begin by asking you once again, Dr. John, Kerala is seeing a spike in cases and almost it's, it's, it's almost an outlier. 50% of India's new cases are from Kerala. Now, there is one side which believes that it is to do with super spreader events. But can super spreader events be the only reason or is the low zero prevalence also playing a part? Well, well I, I'm not sure what is the super spreader event that is being talked about. The Eid um, celebrations the, the and the relaxations for Eid celebrations, many are saying could have contributed yeah. to the spike. Well, you know, b before the Eid uh, relaxation due to the Eid uh, celebration, uh, the, the, the relaxation of the lockdown has been uh, going on for some days now. Um, uh, and of, of course, the crowding uh, during the Eid celebration also may have contributed. But uh, I do not believe that's the sole uh, reason behind uh, current uh, rising of cases. Hmm. Uh, as Everybody can see the cerebral prevalence is very low, which means that more, more than 50% of the state is still susceptible to the virus. Mm. So it, it's only natural that you, you see a rise in uh, cases. Uh, and, uh, you know, because we know that, uh, you know, that there's no herd immunity or the, the, the virus will keep spreading at least until it, 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 it uh, antibodies reaches at least, you know, 85% of the population. So right. Kerala is very far from that threshold. And it's only natural that, that you see a rise in cases. Um, uh, and... You know, this is also inconsistent with the fact that uh, even during the previous wave in Kerala, Kerala had actually seen a very sustained uh, high plateau uh, for almost two months after right. the previous previous wave that happened in Kerala. Dr. John, and, uh, Dr. John is, very, yeah. very simple question here. If you look at the statewide zero prevalence data, are states with a high level of antibodies, therefore, going to see a lesser spike in cases as compared to states with a low level of antibodies, it's almost like states that have actually managed COVID better, which is states like Kerala and Maharashtra that are at the bottom of the table, are seeing the bigger spike in cases. Well, it's, you know, it, 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 it's, it's about how you want to interpret it. You know, I mean, are you saying that, you know, the states who uh, are seeing high uh, seroprevalence, like 75, 76 percent, uh, they are better off or, or the, uh, a state with the low seroprevalence is better off? You know, it, it, it's it's a matter of perspective. In my opinion, uh, I would see the, the, the whole idea of, uh, of managing a pandemic is to uh, reduce the height of that curve. You know, I mean, you, right. you don't want to see like a, a vertical, uh, vertically shaped, uh, you, you want to basically reduce the height of that curve, which, which essentially means that, you know, you reduce the pressure on the healthcare infrastructure. Yes. Okay, and that that essentially means, you know, given that the population is 80, 85 percent of the population needs to be infected either through uh, naturally or through vaccinations. Well, uh, when, well, when in you, this when case, it's naturally high, it because means, the states that are reporting the high zero prevalence <clears throat> don't even have uh, that high vaccine coverage. Let me bring exactly. this to Dr. So, yes, let me bring this to Dr. Yeah. Salunke very quickly then. Dr. Salunke, it's <clears throat> almost like states that have actually managed COVID better, which is states like uh, Kerala, Assam, Maharashtra, which are reporting a low zero prevalence, are now at a disadvantage. Do you think these states, Kerala, Assam, Maharashtra, will see a bigger spike in cases as compared to, say, Madhya Pradesh or Bihar? Uh, no, I don't think so. And as you have rightly stated, and uh, you know, the efficient way with which the 
health system function in Kerala, Maharashtra, are the you know the outcomes of the zero survey are indicative of that. Yes. That is the most important point. And look at the way that so-called natural immunity or infect infection immunity. That means somebody gets the disease, gets the infection, and develops the kind of an antibodies or immunity. That is what is reflected in this particular survey. Hmm. But that doesn't guarantee the states which are having very high level of antibodies that it will remain like that. It is not going to be guaranteed. As a matter of fact, I'm worried. I'm worried about those states which are showing the higher antibody level. And if there, and we know that the health systems in the northern India is definitely not better than Kerala or Maharashtra. That yes, I can but it is you. Kerala that's contributing to 50% of the spike, which is why spike? I'm asking this question. That is right. it because of low zero prevalence? Yes, definitely. Definitely it is because of the low zero prevalence. Definitely because there is a vulnerable section of the population which is in sizable number. Definitely right. that the virus is circulating in Kerala. So naturally you are going to see more cases. But okay. the most important point is that this plateauing it will continue and the efficiency with which the health systems function in Kerala well, they have ensured that the case fatality is definitely lower. Well, so that's something that points, we'll track. That's something that we'll track very closely. Does yeah. the spike in cases in Kerala now uh, contribute and translate into higher hospitalizations and higher fatality or not? One sincerely hopes that's not the case, but it's a, it's a story we'll monitor very closely. Thank you both very much for joining us on this extremely, extremely important development. We're going to keep a close watch on what happens as far as the spike in cases is concerned and, of course, link it uh, to the antibodies data that is now available by the ICMR. But I want to shift our focus to another big development that we're tracking today, and we have a very special guest joining us. The COVID-19 pandemic is largely being touted now as a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Countries that have high vaccine coverage are still seeing a spike in cases, but not necessarily seeing a corresponding spike in deaths. So to make sense of all of this real world data that's now available to us and also to answer that very key question on why countries aren't lifting travel restrictions for fully vaccinated people with WHO approved vaccines. We have Dr. Jerome Kim, the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute, joining us live from Seoul. Thanks so much, Dr. Kim, for being with us. You know, a red carpet is being laid out for some vaccines and some are being relegated to a red list. Is it time for fully vaccinated people with WHO approved vaccine to be allowed to travel globally? So I think it's very important to recognize that in many parts of the world, um, the regulation of, of which vac the decision over which vaccines work and are acceptable in a population fall on the national regulatory authority. And so for much of the world, WHO serves the purpose of that national regulatory authority, providing the kind of expertise that is necessary. In other parts of the world, uh, particularly parts of the world with stringent regulatory authorities, the, the highest level of, of function, the United States, the UK, uh, Europe, Europe, Japan, um, their regulatory authorities may take a, a very different view of uh, the approvals of WHO. So for instance, you know, certain vaccines will be approved by WHO, emergency use listed, we say, uh, but they won't necessarily be approved in the United States. The AstraZeneca vaccine is not yet approved in the United States. So again, you know, from the perspective of the U.S. government, those vaccines are not yet approved for use. And so you know, they might have an issue with a person who says, I've been fully vaccinated with AstraZeneca. Right. But doesn't it lead to vaccine hesitancy in a certain sense if a particular vaccine is, say, not cross-recognized in another country? And the reason I ask this question is because India, for instance, continues to remain on the UK red list, despite the fact that we're vaccinating uh, with the very same AstraZeneca vaccine. Yes. And so I, it gets to um, which version of the AstraZeneca vaccines have been approved and, and where the vaccines are manufactured. So you know, again, as the, the regulatory authority for great for the United Kingdom, the MHRA has to be sure that it, it has been able to adequ adequately supervise the production of a, um, of a from a second site uh, for AstraZeneca. And I think that's underlying some of the difficulty. But you get to a very important question, which is, you know, we're going to have to accept that there are a significant number of vaccines that are out there in general use. And many of these vaccines have published data, have shown safety and efficacy. Many of them have been reviewed by 
regulatory authorities that are at least functional and then further reviewed and approved by the WHO. Hmm. And so there needs to be an international set of agreements that cover this. And unfortunately, that kind of um, agreement uh, has been difficult to come by. Right. But, you know, you raise a very important point, and this is something that the Europe Medicine Agency has also raised about how uh, the same technology vaccine could have differences if it's manufactured in different parts of the world. How does this work? Explain it to the layperson. So it's, um, you know, remember, it's important to remember that vaccines are not like drugs. They're, they're the result of a complex biological process that has a lot of control steps. And for instance, and I'll, I'll, pick, a, I'll pick the mRNA vaccine because it's said that the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine actually has 50,000 individual steps. And each of those steps has a series of controls that go with it. So you can transfer the ability to manufacture something, but you also have to make sure that it passes all the regulatory requirements. So for right. instance, and, and just to, to use cars as an, as an example, there are certain rules and regulations that go into cars that are used in the United States that aren't necessarily used in, in other parts of, of Europe, for instance. Okay. And so those cars have to be modified before they're sent to the United States and, and can be used there. All right. Well, I think that's as simply as, as you could have perhaps put it. Uh, but, you know, the other big story, which is about, uh, you know, the U.S. coming out and saying that the global third wave is going to be largely a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Prima facie, it appears that deaths didn't rise proportionally uh, to cases, especially in countries with a high vaccine coverage. What does the real world data about COVID-19 vaccine efficacy tell us at the moment? You know, it, it's really kind of funny that, that this pandemic of the unvaccinated has, has come out as a, as a meme because it's really always been a pandemic of the unvaccinated. I mean, when you think about it. But it's absolutely true in countries like the United States, a significant number of the new cases and particularly those people who are appearing in hospital and those people who are dying are people who haven't been vaccinated. So in countries that have had, you know, significant access to COVID-19 vaccines, it's those parts of their population that haven't been vaccinated that are proving to be problematic. In other parts of the world, uh, and I'll just pick Korea, for example, um, you know, only 35% of the people have received at least one dose of a vaccine. So the, and, and very few people have been infected, maybe 200,000 out of 51 million. So there are still significant populations at risk in, in these countries. And, and we know that you, know, you can use lockdowns, you can use lots of social distancing, you can impose all sorts of social controls and masks. But in the end, in order to get to escape the economic and, and social and humanitarian consequences of, of COVID-19, you're going to have to vaccinate as quickly as possible with safe and efficacious vaccines. Right. So the real world data, you know, has been encouraging in a certain sense, because while cases continue to rise, there hasn't been a corresponding rise uh, in the number of deaths or even hospitalizations. But I want to ask you about another interesting phenomena, which is, you know, whether it's the UK at the moment where the zero prevalence is high, almost an average of one in 75 people are testing positive or have tested positive for COVID. We're seeing a similar phenomena with states here in India, states which are reporting, uh, you know, a high zero positivity uh, are reporting a low number of cases and the, you know the other side is also true states with low zero positivity are reporting a higher number of cases is herd immunity therefore the only way out of a pandemic and what more can you tell us about herd immunity as far as you know the global pandemic is concerned so herd immunity is an important idea and it, and it is absolutely true that when you hit a certain level of of the presence of antibodies in a population, these infection fighting proteins, that the ability of in further infections to spread becomes limited. It doesn't mean that infections will stop. So, you know, people are always wondering now, well, we've d done all this vaccination. Why are we still hearing about infections? What the vaccines actually do best is to prevent severe infection, hospitalization and death. So even though if you're vaccinated, if you become infected, you don't suffer the consequences the negative, the significant consequences of infection. It also means that, for instance, in the UK now, and, and everyone has their fingers crossed, you know, they've opened up a bit. Yes. They're not seeing a significant surge in deaths or, um, or hospitalizations necessarily. So again, this is the real world evidence. The impact of vaccination 
on, on an entire population. Now, have we seen problems? Yes, there was a city in Brazil. They thought they were at herd immunity because of infections in the early part of 2020. Hmm. In 2021, they had a significant outbreak and lots and lots of people got sick and died. Yes. So we have to be able to trust that the data that we're getting are correct and good. And, and that's going to be really important. I mean, you know, unfortunately, this pandemic has always surprised us in the worst possible way. So, you know, looking at the numbers from, from India, you'd think that maybe we would be at a, at a relative state of, okay. of herd immunity from natural infection in certain states. I have two quick questions to ask you, and I have only 30 seconds less, left, I'm told. Uh, do you think vaccines are going to have to be modified sooner rather than later to respond to emerging variants? So right now, the vaccines that we have work against the, va the variants that we know of. The problem is, of course, um, that these large uncontrolled outbreaks are the source of new variants. So it could be that, you know, in the United States now, the, the new outbreaks that are occurring are generating variants that we don't know about mm. that may be resistant. The Lambda variant in South America appears to have more resistance. So mm. we have to keep an eye out for variants by sequencing the breakthrough infections that are occurring in countries and also beginning to explore where outbreaks are occurring that we really don't have a good idea or a good measure of. Right. Last question. The mask mandate has been reinstated in South Korea and in the US. What does this tell us? Masks are here to stay for the foreseeable future? So um, it never disappeared in Korea. Um, at, despite 35 percent vaccination, they're still encouraging mask use and distancing. Um, in the United States, the Delta variant is, is, is very worrisome. It appears that, you know, when you're vaccinated and infected with Delta, hmm. the amount of virus that you have remains about the same, although you don't get as sick. But the fact that you have that virus there means that you can transmit it. And so, again, remember that masks probably do a, a reasonable job protecting you, but they do a really good job of protecting other people if you're infected. So we need to continue to wear masks. All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Jerome Kim, for joining us on NDTV. Thanks. All right. With that, we're going to slip into a very short break. Up next, we'll answer all your questions on the coronavirus vaccine. Stay with us. Well, on to our special campaign, Vaccinate India, in partnership with Google. We're discussing questions you may have about the coronavirus vaccine. And Dr. Praveen Chandra, Padmashri Awardee and Chairman in Interventional Cardiology, joins us from the Medanta Hospital. Thanks so much, Doctor, for being with us. Uh, one of the most commonly asked questions, how long does it take to develop immunity after you've been vaccinated? Okay, so that's a, you know, a very common question and very important one as well, because Many times we have heard people saying that, you know, I got vaccinated and soon after I got, you know, COVID. But we people must know that it takes two weeks from the first dose of vaccination. It takes two weeks to get the immunity. And after the second dose also to get the full immunity, it will take another two weeks. So that is why one should know that if they are going for a vaccination, they should protect themselves, masking, etc. And, you know, all those precautions must carry on till two weeks at, until vaccination and however now we also recommend that you should continue the preventive measures even if you are vaccinated. Right and uh, what about the difference in immunity with one dose versus two doses? I mean you know we have discussed this uh, so many times now that one dose also gives immunity but as for example you know with the Covishield vaccine the first dose will give an immunity of in the range of about 50 to 55 percent. And if you take the second dose, after three months or you know, uh, about eight to 10 weeks, then the immunity level goes up to 75 to 80 percent. But the protection from dying or protection from developing a very severe disease is almost in the range of above 95 percent. So that is why it is very safe and you know it, it does not lead to any serious illness after one gets the two doses of vaccination right and uh, how do you gauge uh, you know how immune you are and what degree of immunity or protection you have from covid uh, after you've been vaccinated i mean you know you can know that uh, by checking your antibody levels one can know that whether the 
you know immunity has developed to a full extent or a very partial extent or maybe nothing but generally we do not recommend people to get their you know antibody levels done most of the times if they have taken the two dose of vaccination they are protected for at least 95% times there is no chance of having a serious illness hospitalization or death so right. one should be secure and safe and there is no panic to get a test done to know whether they are secure or not all right uh, can a vaccinated person give covid to an unvaccinated person a vaccinated person can give covid to another person but certainly the chance of transmitting the infection is much lesser why because the the virus will not replicate in those numbers unless until they are variant kind of viruses they will not replicate in those numbers inside the respiratory tract of that person who is already vaccinated so which means that if somebody if there are people in your surroundings and they are vaccinated you have very less chance of getting a infection but compared to those people where nobody you don't know whether they are vaccinated or not you have to be very careful so that is the implication of knowing this information right but vaccinated individuals could be um, could potentially be asymptomatic carriers of covid couldn't they they can be if that and generally it happens only if for example they had a you know if somebody has a immunity against a various kind of you know uh, subgroups of these viruses so this is why we are now talking that those new mutants can actually be resistant to the vaccination or to the previous covid infection so that is why it is being recommended that you have to prevent and that's why you heard that in many countries even if the vaccination level is gone up to 70% or 80% still we are recommending that it's better to have the social distancing better to have you know uh, the masking right. and also you know maintain sanitization all yeah. right well thanks so much dr chandra for joining us thank you thank you